So hi everyone and welcome to our latest Biome podcast with Emma and Roby. Um, so this week we are going to be talking about the reintroduction of the European bison, which is Woo! very exciting. <laughs> I feel like we've been on a bison tangent for the last couple of months. <laughs> oh, so long. I, I mean, ugh, I, I, where do the bison end? Where do they begin? I mean, we've just done so much bison work. Yeah. Um, but we're really, really excited about these bison. And I think part of the reason we are is because this is actually something that's going to happen here in the UK in the next couple of years. So with some of the 2022. other 2022! <laughs> yeah, spring 2022, the bison are coming to the UK. Um, so yeah, we're going to tell you a bit more about that and hopefully you guys listen to our interview that we did with Stan Smith. He kind of explains the project a lot better than we could because obviously he, he knows the ins and outs We just kind of nerd out about on. bison. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we're just we... bison nerds. He actually knows what he's talking about. <laughs> so with this podcast, we're going to go a little overview of bison and then we're going to delve into their phylogeny and evolution. We're going to maybe show you a different side to bison, maybe one that isn't kind of widely known about their history and their former range, just because a lot of the impacts of bison, the positive impacts we did talk about with Stan Smith. So we hope you enjoyed the other side to bison in this episode yeah hopefully it just gives a different perspective um because there's so much about bison um so what we're going to do in this episode sort of as a structure is we're going to go through an overview of european bison and then a bit about their evolution their phylogeny um and then briefly touch on kind of some different benefits that bison can bring to the environment which maybe we didn't mention last week um some very obscure ones because that's <laughs> how we <laughs> like to do toads. things <laughs> yes stay tuned for toads um <laughs> and then yeah a little overview of the project but hopefully you listen to our interview if you haven't check it out because stan smith is an amazing guy and we learned a lot um from speaking to him yeah it was a real it was a real privilege to be able to speak to someone who's actually involved with this project uh, for, or literally, literally on the ground. So Emma, why don't you take it away with a little overview about the European bison? Yeah, sounds good. So um, with European bison, they are the largest surviving remnants of European megafauna. So they used to be incredibly abundant. So n not the European bison, I have to state. So it would be the steppe bison, the kind of their ancestor that used to be so, so abundant in the Pleistocene, I think someone described them as the cockroaches of the Pleistocene. <laughs> <laughs> Everything was more abundant in the Pleistocene. Everything was bigger and there was lots of them. <laughs> Can we go back to the Pleistocene? <laughs> I would love to go back to the Pleistocene. We'd have a great time. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, they would have been abundant as things like the large herbivores that you get on the Serengeti today. So wildebeest and zebra and things like that. Um, but with the European bison, the ones, particularly the males, they are Europe's heaviest wild animal. Chonky. Um, so, yeah. <laughs> we say that about a lot of things. I know. <laughs> <laughs> but the males can weigh around 800 kilos. So um, almost a tonne. Getting nearly, get, nearly getting to a tonne in weight. That's, pff, that's, that's a big bison. That's similar to elephant size, isn't it? They're about a tonne. Elephants are more than a tonne. I don't know, in my head, bison and elephant seem like a similar size, but maybe That's not. That's so weird. Bison are, like, <laughs> elephants are, can be six tons or more. Okay, maybe I was very wrong. There. What are you on about? <laughs> <laughs> okay, I, part of the reason maybe I say that is because bison are very, kind of very stocky, made of mm. lots of muscle, um, mm. and they would be around two metres high. So that's taller than me. Um, because... Even taller than me. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so it's not just me this time. You, you think I'm short. Um, <laughs> but um, so in Europe, the last wild population is thought to have lived in. Okay, let me try and get this pronunciation right. I had to look it up. Um, Biawa Vieja Forest. Biawa Vieja. Yeah, Ooh, I, think, a lovely name. I think that's how you say it. Um, <laughs> it's a great name. I love it. So that is in Poland, and that is where they were until 1919, it's thought. Um, and then they went extinct after World War One, and that was partly due to poaching and habitat loss. So humans... The, the, the usual two. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Um, and it's only... Basically, they went into this massive genetic bottleneck as a result of um, them going extinct in the wild. So it was a population of... 
I think it was 12, was it, right? I think 12, 12 survived, yeah. yeah. So I think it was 12 captive bison in, I want to say Berlin. It was somewhere in Europe. I think um, it was Berlin. I think so. Yeah, I think they're doing a lot with, with bison conservation. Mm. And it was basically those 12 individuals that were carefully bred through captive breeding programs. And thanks to that, they've now been brought back, which is very exciting. Mm. Um, yeah. So do you want to talk so, a bit like an overview of kind of their phylogeny, their evolution? Because yeah. bison, bison are pretty cool. Bison are pretty cool. They're also quite confusing. So there are two living species of bison, all in the genus bison, which is, you know, handy. You've got the American bison, which is bison bison, and then the European <laughs> bison, which we're talking about, bison bonassus. And these two are sister species. So they're both the descendants of a common ancestor, which was, as we already mentioned, the Ice Age steppe bison. bison Such Christus. an epic bison. <laughs> Very epic bison. One of one of my favourite bisons. Um, but... <laughs> You might be a little a little confused because when Americans say buffalo, they're talking about the American bison. And we, when Europeans say buffalo, we're talking about the African animal on the plains getting hunted by That's lions. That's so which confusing. Is, which is a whole different genus, Cincerus, and not closely related. Um, in India, there is also another animal called a bison. This is the Indian forest bison, or more properly called the gaur, which is the largest living bovid. But again, not closely related to true bison. And there are also other buffaloes, the Asian water buffaloes. And again, not closely related to bison. So you've got the true bison, the African buffaloes, the Indian bison, and then the Asiatic buffaloes. But the ones we're talking about are the true bison. <laughs> my only that just blew my mind. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and so... The European bison is the descendant of this this fantastic Ice Age steppe bison, which was incredibly wide ranging. It used to across North America and Eurasia from England to Mexico. So it was a really, really widespread species. <gasps> oh, that's cool. That is, it is very cool. And uh, this species actually evolved in Europe many millions of years before they ever got to America, which they only got to America about 130,000 years ago. So we think of bison is this quintessentially american midwest species but actually they're fairly recent uh fairly recent arrivals there that's interesting because you would have thought yeah the, like you were saying the americans are kind of very i don't know if, if proud very proud of word? their bison yeah, yeah. Pr <laughs> proud of their bison and kind of you think of the wild west and that's where mm. bison come in mm. and now obviously the european bison and the american bison are sister sister lineages but they've taken very different journeys so the the european bison is essentially one step removed from the steppe bison the steppe bison gave way to the european bison so but it's in just north a america, single descendant then it's be... essentially yeah okay. but in north america there was this whole massive range of uh, transitionary forms so the steppe bison entered north america and found the niche of mega herbivore you know mega grazer empty and so it exploded in both population size and in body size. So it evolved into the giant bison, bison latifrons, which was even bigger than bison are today. How big was that? I bet that was an impressive, impressive bison. Two and a half metres tall at the shoulder with two metre horns span. Yeah. Wow. So it was a heckin' big bison. Um but then what's really interesting is that by looking at these American bison and their lineage, we can see the impact of both humans and climate on one lineage. So the steppe bison arrived. It found all this empty, empty grassland and exploded to become the, the giant bison. But then a new glacial period began, which meant that the grazing area reduced. And so the giant bison shrunk into a new form, the ancient bison, Bison Anticus. And then the arrival of Paleo-American hunters in North America suddenly added predation pressure to the, the bison Anticus, which in turn gave rise to the Western bison, bison occidentalis. And then when the, the you know the final megafaunal extinctions at the end of the Pleistocene happened, that further shrunk the Western bison into the modern American bison, which is the, the, the smallest of this lineage. So it's fascinating. Just in one lineage, you can see the effects of both climate change and human in interaction just on this one species which I, I think is really cool <laughs> no i think that's amazing how you can see like you were saying generally how habitats and just yeah a whole load of different factors um go into the evolution of a species um mm. because actually but there's also, also... Hmm? no go well ahead. i was just gonna say there's also something up with the european bison as i understand yes there is there's some very um interesting genetics there with the european Ooh, we bison we love some interesting genetics <laughs> um, which so we actually got this from it was a book called the missing links um is it ross barnett 
Is yes, by a paleontologist yeah. called Ross Barnett. So if you're interested in Pleistocene megafauna, fantastic book. Absolutely fantastic. It's really, really well written. And I think it explains this bit really, really well about kind of mm. genetics, these these interesting genetics. Mm. So what they did um, when they were studying these genetics, they were looking at mitochondrial DNA. And so what this is, is it can only be passed on um, down the female line. So say the daughter will get it passed on from the mother, will get it passed on from the grandmother and things like that. So that's how you trace mitochondrial DNA. And what they found is that the modern European bison is actually a descendant of a hybrid ancestor. So Ooh. yeah, hybrid ancestors that's are That's kind cool. of weird. Because often you don't think of sort of species hybridization being able to be successful because we have such a rigid definition of species yeah. and their ability to interbreed that this kind of makes you think a little bit. Hmm. So what they think is that, so the modern European bison is a descendant of an os- offspring of a male step bison, so those ones that, okay. that we mentioned, mm-hmm. and a female oryx. Um, Ooh, that's a which... whole different genus though. It is. So that's hybridization oryx... between two genera. Yeah, they're very like if you look up an oryx, that is the ancestor of modern cattle. Mm. So And they... a very different animal. Very. So in my mind, that kind of completely makes me rethink the idea of species interbreeding. Because like you say, it's not even species, it's between different different genuses. Yeah. Um and so hmm. they think why this may have been advantageous and why it survived was because these these oryx genes possibly enabled them enabled the european bison to survive when the steppe bison didn't in a changing oh. kind of european climate so the idea that you've got this warming period after the ice age and because they had these advantageous oryx genes they were able to survive whereas the, the steppe bison went extinct which is fascinating oh, that's really cool that's <laughs> i love that that's incre- yeah, that's really nice and that, that's also wow. kind of, I think, been supported by evidence today. So there's some, been some genetic breeding experiments where if you cross a cow and a bison, the males mm. are infertile, but the females mm. are fertile. So this... Oh, so you can it, actually yeah. prove that it's possible. Yeah. So that oh, kind wow. of proves that the oryx step bison hybridization. Um, but no, I, I just, I found possible? that really, really um, kind yeah. of unusual. Um, and... Because these European bison are, are quite unusual in that we're not entirely sure whether they were ever in the UK. Because we know oryx were and we know steppe bison were. But I, I, I think there's a bit of a issue. Well, not an issue. I think people are a bit confused as to whether European bison were here. Yeah, I think it's, that's an interesting one because we don't have any fossil skeletons or things like that. So you do have European bison kind of bone carvings, I think, that have been mm. found. Um, but it's unclear if they ever lived in Europe. Um, in Europe? Or, uh, no, wrong. <laughs> if they, <laughs> it's they unclear if they it's do. unclear if they ever lived here in the UK. Sorry. Mm. Um, but so it is clear step bison lived here, um, but not sure about the European one. Mm. Um, so that was know, an. Imp- I, I... Hmm? No, go on. I guess that was just that was an important decision when looking to introduce bison back into the UK is even if European bison weren't here, the important thing is that they take the closest descendant of what used to live in this area to make it best adapted to to the habitat here. And I, I guess the point is, it's not actually about the species, it's the it's about the services you bring back. So it doesn't matter that it's not a steppe bison, it's a European bison, as long as the niche is the same and as long as the services can can uh, you know provided are the same then that's what's important and i think it's also quite important to remember that evidence sorry absence of evidence is not evidence of absence so it's entirely possible that european bison were here just because i don't know sampling or preservation bias we haven't found any yet i mean that goes like even with say like whale evolution there was a long time where they were missing kind of fossil records which kind of didn't explain millions of years of evolutionary history and then it was found (laughs) Um, yeah, yeah. So kind of, yeah, things do change. Um, I mean, I'd be like quite surprised if the European the... bison wasn't found here. Yeah, I, I would I would assume they maybe were here, but maybe we just haven't got evidence. Um, but so, yeah, you were mentioning about the services. Do we want to go through some maybe like of the yes. different things that like we weren't that weren't mentioned in the interview? Yeah. 
So I know there's quite an interesting one about toads you're quite keen on. (laughs) (laughs) I think the toads one is one of the most unusual ones. So this was in the Carpathian Mountains, um, which I want to say was in Romania. Um, I mean, the Carpathians yes, stretch and eight countries. Um, so I think this this was a study in Romania. And they found that when these European bison were brought back, is they have these huge hoof prints. Um, and there are, there's this tiny, tiny species called a yellow-bellied toad. Um, and they're, yeah, they're very, very sweet little things. And for a little toad that small, it's they have to travel about 200 meters often to get from one area of water to another pond which is quite a lot if you're that small um and so what they found is these hoof prints from the bison they fill with water and this actually provides stopping points along the way so (laughs) they can just stop in the hoof print kind of reabsorb moisture oxygen into their skin um and then yeah continue their journey which i thought was a (laughs) oh that's cute i mean Another little benefit that bison bring to, uh, you know, on the same thing of bringing, bringing a benefit to the wider community is that in winter when the snow's on the ground, the bison are strong enough to, you know, really shovel the snow with their heads to get down to the vegetation beneath. And this obviously benefits a whole suite of other organisms. So it benefits uh, birds, which will come down and look for the insects or seeds that are dormant there. It benefits rodents, who now can access that food source as well. Smaller deer species as well. You know, bison are incredible engineers not just of the physical ecosystem but creating niches for other animals to thrive in which because there'd be you know... very, very few things that could plow through snow in that way a lot of yeah, other I mean... animals are kind of inhibited massively in their feeding and foraging mm. when the snow is that deep so mm. yeah that's... so b- bison help the winter survival of other species which is quite nice i think you know Good for and the they, bison. they also have um, a role with pine plantations, don't they? They do. And this is really relevant to what the Kent Wildlife Trust are trying to do in Wilder Bleen. So obviously Britain is covered in pine plantations, which are quite biodiver- uh, quite um, low in biodiversity because it's essentially a monoculture, isn't it? There's only yeah. one species of tree. No light reaches the bottom of the of the forest floor. So they're quite they're quite ecologically barren. Um but bison can naturally regenerate pine plantations as they move through and they kind of break things. And they rub against the trees and get the bark off and, you know, eat bark in the winter as well. They selectively kill off the the, the the weaker trees. And this creates a more healthy woodland because it allows light to come through and that allows, uh, you know, glades and meadows to form. And you get woodland scrub and other species of trees Um Ground nesting birds like nightingales and turtle doves are particularly uh, positively affected by this. Um, and obviously, getting rid of pine plantations, which were planted largely for our ship industry and the Industrial Revolution and the various world wars, is really labour intensive if you have to do it with people. It's expensive, labour intensive. You need machinery and protection and training to do it. But bison just do it like that. So they're a fantastic uh, regenerator of pine forests. Because I think that's something that Stan Smith was saying as well in the interview, just sort of how labour intensive it is for humans to manage woodland. So if Mm. we can have these engineers, these ecosystem engineers that are doing it for us and doing it better, I would argue, um, (laughs) that, that, yeah, that's a massive benefit that they provide. Um, And so there's another, well, really nice uh, kind of, again small scale benefit for other organisms is is how they how they clean themselves or how they how they wash almost yeah so it's really really interesting seeing them do this so we're actually going to show you some footage of this this is from my friend dominic so thanks so much for letting us use the footage um this is a bison that is having a sand bath um so what you can see here it's kind of um on the screen now it's rolling around in the sand um there's all these like dust clouds going everywhere it's really really impressive seeing that and what they do and that's kind of a way to remove parasites um on their fur and as they do this they create clearings and micro habitats um which like you mentioned roby is kind of very beneficial for a whole variety of species so small things like insects which then could benefit things like bats because (laughs) we love bats um (laughs) and so yeah it's this these micro habitats um um which are created by bison activity which is brilliant 
And as you can see on the screen here, the bison have this wonderfully dense and thick fur. And that plays into another role they have in the ecosystem, which is seed dispersers. So I'm sure if you've gone for a, a walk on the woods and, and come back and you've got all these kind of little spiky seeds caught to you. Well, imagine nearly a ton of bison walking through the woods. It picks up a lot of these seeds. And as it kind of shakes itself and scratches, it disperses the seeds. And also all the seeds that it eats because it's quite a large animal. It can eat larger seeds, which other animals can't. So it plays a really key role in moving plants about the forest as they reproduce. And uh, I think that's reason enough to bring them back. Um, yeah, just definitely. because, you know, I think we need a bit more diversity in our forests. Um, so yeah, why didn't why didn't you tell us a bit more about the Wilderbleen project? Uh, we did speak to Stan Smith, so you can check that interview out, uh, and he goes into some real detail. But shall we do a quick overview just in case you haven't seen it? Yeah, yeah. I mean, like yeah, Roby said, obviously he explains it really well. But just as an <laughs> overview, um, the plan is to bring in. So they're going to form a herd of bison. So it's quite important that they've already formed a herd before they arrived because. You want them to kind of be familiar with, with each other and kind of working as a, as a family unit. So they're going to bring in, I think it's under 10 individuals, so, sort of keep it small scale at first. I think it's and, four. I think the first lot is four. Because I thought that, but then when we talked to Stan on the interview, mm. he sort of just said under 10. Like it, that oh, it so didn't, maybe they're keeping it open. Yeah. I think as long as the herd is formed, they were quite flexible. I vote nine. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. <laughs> Why not? <laughs> And so they are bringing them into a place called Bleen Forest, which is in Canterbury, um, which is... Is that Kent, Roby? Yeah. 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 Okay. I'm not good at... Not good at geography. <laughs> British geography. <laughs> um, but... And don't worry, this is very controlled. You're not going to have bison just casually walking down Canterbury High Street. <laughs> um, so they're going to put them in sort of an enclosed, fenced area. Um, they're going to let them settle. So the idea is that they are going to be as wild as possible. They're not going to be fed. They're not going to have shelter. And then over time, the hope is that you can have viewing platforms for people to watch them and possibly guided ranger walks as well. And I think that's a really important thing you just you just touched upon, the fact that these aren't just going to be roaming the countryside. They haven't just decided, yep, bison, and they should release the bison <laughs> stampede. Um, they are here for a reason. They have been brought back in a controlled area to regenerate this woodland and to observe how bison can regenerate because they've also got some other fenced off woodland with no bison and so they're going to compare essentially the impact that bison have. Um, so it's not just bison willy willy nilly all over the place um, and when these bison start reproducing and their numbers increase they're going, they hope that by that time there will be other projects like Bleen ready to take bison. So they're not just going to be turned loose. They're, they're going to be breeding and then move to certain sites around the country to fill a job. It will be tightly monitored and tightly observed, as this should be, because they are quite dangerous animals, or at least they have the potential to be. There's never been any issues with them before in Europe. Um, but yeah, I think this is the perfect way to reintroduce a large animal like this. I think they're doing everything right. Um, and we need more of these nature-based solutions to tackle the climate and nature crisis, and especially bison as these keystone species. Um, and for what it's worth, and I, you know, we are very much behind the rest of Europe when it comes to bison reintroduction. Absolutely, we are... I think with just wilding in general. Um, yeah. I mean, that I use wilding because this is a topic that um, that Stan Smith brought up: this idea of wilding rather than rewilding. Um, so everyone's kind of talking about, about rewilding at the moment, but his point is that we can't go back in time. Um, we have to work with kind of the modern issues that we have at the moment to deal with, um, kind of come up with modern solutions, um, mm. and engaging people in nature and things like that, rather than trying to go back to mm. a period in history, which we don't have anymore. Mm. But yeah, we, we are very far behind, um, <laughs> I mean, they think there are they they reckon there are around eight thousand wild bison in Europe uh, as of twenty nineteen. So it might have increased uh, since then. That's and pretty it re impressive, though, given that there yeah. were twelve individuals from yeah. which they were bred from. And you've got a real range in numbers in different countries. So Austria has got about ten, Germany's got about twenty, all the way up to um, you know places in the in the in the hundreds. Lithuania's got about two hundred and twenty to the most, which is. Poland, Belarus, and Ukraine. Belarus has 2,000 animals. Ukraine has 240. And Poland has 2,269 
lots of which are in bison yeah lots of (laughs) which are in bialavieja forest uh so yeah we are really lagging behind and we need to get our act together because bison are fantastic and we need them both for the ecosystem and you know they're part of the heritage of the british people i think and we need them back no i would fully agree and i think for the uk which has quite a kind of zoophobic nature to Mm. to wild animals like compared to other european countries we don't have (laughs) any of our large carnivores we don't have kind of any large megafauna um Mm. but i think with the uk it's important that we've seen this work in other european countries Mm. so the fact that all the ones you just mentioned have reintroduced bison successfully i think will help the british public get more on board because if we were just starting it with no other countries having done it i think people Mm. would be a bit more hesitant and i and i think it's kind of the fact that other countries in europe have done it do kind of allay some of our fears you know it's quite often said that oh Britain's too small to reintroduce the megafauna. And yet this hasn't stopped Lithuania, which is around 220 animals, or Moldova, uh, or Slovakia. And, I mean, you know, Netherlands, that's the tiny The Netherlands, well. <laughs> yeah, which is three herds. Um, and then people also say, well, it's too expensive. We don't have enough money. And again, that hasn't stopped Belarus, Lithuania, Moldova, Poland, Romania, Slovakia, all places which perhaps don't have the budget for this sort of stuff. Or, we, you know have less of a budget than we do for environmental recovery and yet are still ahead of us with this so it can also, be done i think and it's good yeah. that it is yeah and also i think a point to make with that like on the cost is that long term the hope is that having these amazing sort of landscape engineers will make things cheaper because it will mean that mm. humans don't have to go in and manage woodland it can just be done so you can hear this in the interview but the idea that they're bringing in so it's not just bison it's bison this type of pony is it conic ponies i think conic yeah, ponies yeah i think so and then it's a hybrid pig species which is a cross between a wild boar and a domesticated pig i think um, iron age pigs they're called yeah. Yeah, yeah 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 that's right and so the idea is that this team working together of animals that each provide slightly different services can regenerate the woodland and hopefully people will see that as a, a positive positive mm. thing so yeah we hope you enjoyed this episode it's probably a good place to wrap up just so we don't ramble for too long um but yeah there's lots and lots of exciting stuff to get involved with when it comes to bison you can support the wild Ableen project by going by looking through the kent wildlife trust or wildwood trust um and yeah get ready get the binos and the cameras ready because in 2022 we're gonna have bison and we will be first in line to go see them we are definitely (laughs) going to see them (laughs) but yeah thanks so much for listening and if you want any more updates about podcasts you can subscribe to the um biome podcast on youtube and then we also post updates on instagram as well so that's at biome by grizzly and then if you wanted to check us out, because we'll probably be posting, raising awareness <laughs> about variety of wildlife stuff and probably more bison. Um, <laughs> we are Emma Hodson Wildlife and Roby Watkinson Wildlife. So yeah, thanks so much for listening and we will see you next time. See you next time. Bye. Bye.